Aloha and welcome to Cooper Union, what's happening with human rights around our world on ThinkTech Live broadcasting from our downtown studio in Honolulu, Hawaii in Moana Nui Akea. I'm your host, Joshua Cooper. And today's episode is the UN Commission on the Status of Women 66 session, Women's Equality in a Warming World. I'm so fortunate to be joined by three amazing activists who are advocating for climate justice in the world. And we'll be looking at the important issues of what happened recently in New York at the UN Commission on the Status of Women. Nolene, what were some of the exciting aspects that happened at the CSW? And can you share some of those results? Sure. I, I think I'd start by saying that for us, one of the significant things um, about this year, apart from the fact that it's taken um, 65 commissions um, to have a specific focus on uh, gender, climate change and um, disaster risk and response. So that in itself is is a huge precedent setting commission on the status of women. And and what we really needed to do was make sure that what is what was in the language is helpful, not yet just for this year, but really carrying forward into the future. So that's the first point. The second was that because it was a um, hybrid um, set of work where we had a lot of us who were online um, and, and, and some that were in New York, but a, quite a small number when you look at the thousands that it's usually the most well attended um, multilateral um, negotiation, uh, neg negotiating space. So that's really important as well is that People are trying to make sure that those of us, particularly in the economic south and in climate frontline communities, are really engaged in the work that is happening there in New York at the at the UN at the Commission on the Status of Women. The third point to make is we we were really quite you know, I, I would say stressed and angry that many of the decisions around access were happening very, very late. And for us, it's a huge thing to travel from the Pacific. You know, there are long haul flights that are involved, but also we have the issue of public health and COVID-19 to, to, to work through. So we decided on a, a saturation on, a online campaign um, and really tried to work as four of the larger networks within the Pacific who are working on gender and climate change um, and and sustainable development. So um, between Diva for Equality, um, the Pacific Feminist um, uh, Community of Practice, um, PCAN, which Jeshua will speak to a little later, um, and Shifting the Power Coalition, we really brought in a whole range of various groups who then were able to mobilize and kind of bring all the messages from the Pacific. And it was really significant to see that there was another campaign similar from Africa called um, CSW uh, so Africa disrupt CSW 66. And I think it's because people understand that the multilateral system right now needs to be really, really strong and clear about what is the international, you know, we talk about international community, but who is it? Does it include those of us who are in climate frontline states? Does it include small island peoples? Does it include indigenous and local groups? And so we were determined no matter what was happening in the real politique, um, in the spaces of New York in the spaces of um, you know London and 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 uh, Bonn and everywhere else that we were doing our own part to make sure our voices are heard. So I think I'd just start there and then I'll come back. Thank you. Thank you so much for that beginning. You bring up a great point because this year the conference of parties for the UN Framework Commission on Climate Change will be happening and hosted by Africa. So it's great to bring Oceania and the Pacific together and make sure that the people on the front line voices are absolutely heard. Carlo, can you share some of your perspectives of what happened and some of the results that were most compelling for you? Um, uh, thank you, Joshua. Yes, for um, CSW 66 this year, I kind of uh, really see the engagement of youth, of young women, of young families um, being uh, in action um, because of, of the priority theme itself, uh, saying uh, climate change in the context of empowering women and girls. So um, in terms of climate change was in the Pacific, climate change, um, it, it links to all other issues. It links to violence against women, it links to violence against um, girls and uh, children, it links to poverty, it links to uh, violence against LGBTIQ uh, members, it links to the um, most of other issues like um, indigenous women, our, our environment, our food chain, our food sovereignty, our biodiversity as a whole. So for us to be engaged in, in a global platform uh, coming from a grassroots community level, it, this is important to us because of our voices. Most of the time, our voices are not being heard, even at community levels, even at national levels, for instance. 
but for us to even in uh, being included in the speaking side event session, the speaking slots. This is where we really prioritize the, the theme, really prioritize our issues being brought up into global level because of we don't just woke up uh, one morning and become activists or become families because we have lived the realities of climate change, of the climate crisis, the urgency of, of, of this issue is so, is so urgent because we want to get uh, the climate action really fast because of because constant um, change in weather patterns because of the front line of our communities. Um, we're facing flood every now and then. Um, we have our villages being displaced, being moved from, um, from one place to another. Our children um, are being affected, you know, because of, we just recently um, came out from the pandemic. There's education system on hold, employment on hold. So we can um, imagine the, the, the poverty increasing, imagine the high, highest increase of violence and coming from a small island state where the highest, uh, the, uh, the, um, the rate of violence is highest, second highest. So it is, it is, it is uh, portraying a picture of this, this urgent work to do, um, Joshua. So that, this is where um, CSW for us as young families, indigenous women, you know, for us uh, to be included in this making levels, because if something, if there's development in the community, we should be included in this making level. Not only um, women, also young people, because we are fighting not only for our future here, the future of our children coming before us and for this beautiful planet, also the beautiful species that we um, engage with every day. Yeah, thank you, Jason. No, oh, thank you so much. And you really brought up the human rights-based approach to make sure that the rights of people, but also our mother earth is respected. And you really made the interconnectedness of all the issues, how one leads to the other. And too many times with the sustainable development goals, people focus on one goal or two goals, but all the goals build on one another. And your foundation was so strong, making sure that directly impacted peoples are speaking for themselves at these global arenas to make sure that people understand what's really happening. Joshua, anything you want to share about the CSW or any result that stood out to you? It's great to have my brother from another mother there. We got the same name. And my mom's name is Hope. So we're just like connected. <laughs> In Fiji, I would, I would call you Yava. Um, given that we share almost the first name um, and practically the same last name. Um, but thank you. No, I think Nolene and Vika have summed it up so perfectly. I don't know how to possibly follow that. Um, but there is one thing that, that Nolene said that I think I'll just add on to, and that's the, um, the barriers to access. Um, uh, you know, it's one thing to be able to participate online virtually. It's something completely different to be physically present in those, sp in those spaces um, to be there with the negotiators, with decision makers, and you look at the outcomes document and you look at the text and they talk about things like meaningful participation. But this is what we mean by meaningful participation. Meaningful participation has to be about looking at what are those barriers to access, um, looking at how we as, as activists and people in civil society spaces can positively influence the spaces and influence the texts and the, and the decisions that are coming out of it. So I think for us, it's not just about the, the language that we see in the text, but also about taking that language and making it practice. Um, I think that's, that's all that I have to add, yeah. Oh no, it's exactly true. And it's really the work by the NGOs in that coalition. It's great to have Diva there, Feminist Policy Agenda, Pacific Island Climate Action Network, and to highlight how we really are large ocean nations that have to be included at the table, and more importantly, have the ancestral wisdom that the world will be able to survive when listening, as opposed to ignoring as they have done in the past in the pursuit of profit, ignoring people in the planet. Nolene, can you share with us, because you really did a lot of the organizing before it. We didn't just wake up, as Kahlo said, and get to speak at a side event. What was done to be able to make sure that the voice of Oceania was present? And then what were some of the major side events and really the highlights? Because it is true, part of the work is oh. focusing on paragraphs and, and small periods and all the little parts of those outcome document, but there's so many other aspects. Can you give people a taste and a flavor of New York City and the CSW, as you said, is one of the biggest multi diplomatic events that ever happened at the UN? 
Thank you. Um, yes, we started way back last year. So um, really around September, October, we were already planning toward it. Um, uh, really, as soon as we heard the, you know, what the theme was going to be, we moved into, into action and started um, preparing and organizing. So we've worked with um, Pacific Island governments. We've worked with um, the Pacific um, Forum Secretariat. We've worked with um, SPC uh, and, and many other um, institutions and governments through the Pacific. And we did that deliberately because we wanted to be part of a, a combined um, set of um, analysis and positions that came through. Um, and so we had a one-on-one -on -one climate, uh, gender and climate training that was organized um, with uh, for with the support of the forum where the uh, civil society in the Pacific actually worked with and shared our knowledge um, and our experience with um, the gender um, uh, the gender machinery they call it um, which is sounds a bit kind of you know uh, I don't know I don't like that language but it, it's really the 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 women's ministries, um, anyone who's working on gender within governments, we tried to bring together and make sure um, that they were they were prepared and that we were prepared to be working with them. Um, because often we have our sets of work in social movements and they're incredibly important. Um, and sometimes they align very easily um, with government. And sometimes it's very difficult to be in the same room or even online working together productively. And we have to be there. We have to be working with each other, knowing what each other's positions are. So that all started very early last year. Then I also, uh, myself and um, Nalini Singh and um, Marioni from Dawn were part of the um, uh, CSW 66 expert working group. So being on that, we were able to influence the report that then is taken to the UN Secretary General and make sure that our positions were going through from there as well. So I think it's incredibly important to have both the kind of mainstream sets of work that we're doing, and then also make sure that um, we're working on the ground with the groups who who themselves often don't have access to these multilateral spaces. So there is some deliberate um, uh, uh, coordination that occurs. It's a really big load on organizations that already have very limited resources. So that's part of what we do. We talk, we work we worked on mitigation, we worked on adaptation, we worked on loss and damage positions, we tried to make sure that they were clear for ourselves and came from the communities in which we work, the constituencies. And the out, on the outcomes, I just say, um, Joshua, that, you know, Commission on the Status of Women, I've been through many, many now, and there are blend always of positives and missed opportunities. And sometimes there are outright negatives because of the political play that happens within negotiations rooms and we would be naive if we didn't talk about that so for instance we're absolutely furious I have to say that environmental human rights defenders were left out of the text they were in the text early and then there was negotiation and they came out you know to have a removal from from reality um, is is really upsetting for us because there's women and gender non-binary people and others men as well who are giving their lives their family their safety and other priorities for this work around the world and we and these numbers are rising every year um, every year more um, die and are affected and the vast majority of those activists are indigenous peoples um, protecting the 20 percent of the earth that holds the 80 percent of biodiversity so that does make us um, very angry um, and for them to be so casually dismissed. But we're really happy, for instance, for the first time ever in the agreed conclusions to see a mention. Um, you like this, Joshua, as well in your work to see mention of jo um, journalists and media workers. That's the very first time ever in Commission on the Status of Women. We've been fighting for that, a struggle for that for a long time. So we were quite surprised that it went through um, with no struggle. And sometimes it is like that, that you can work for years for a text change and then all of a sudden in the middle of some context it becomes clear that that it's time for that that text to be in there also we're not entirely happy with the loss and damage in the agreed outcomes um, there's barely a mention there's actually just a couple in fact um, and and we had a loss at the very last minute in the preambular section but we're very pleased that there's two paragraphs in the operating section because um, for anyone who's not familiar with those out agreed outcomes um, it, it is that that's where the decisions that come out are operationalized. So 
through the rest of the year, governments will work out. How are we going to put that into practice? We push on those. How do we make those real, as, as both Cardo and um, Vika and Jeshua said? So um, we, it's shocking, actually, that there's no mention of intimate partner violence. So we were really pushing for that. It didn't get through. There's only one mention of sexual and reproductive health and rights. And we all know that in crises, women's bodies are under a lot of attack, even more than usual, but also that the access to emergency contraception and all those issues that are about transformation of the state and transformation of society so that everyone has their rights respected is really important. So there's a lot of work to do now um, but but really we also got many good um, sets of language in to have loss and damage in there is a very big struggle to have so many references to young women and girls was really important as Cardo said and they were just leaders um, in the process um, Australia I have to say Joshua is such a laggard on climate policy um, and when I actually challenged in the campaign in New York some positions on loss and damage um, I said that CSW agreed outcomes wouldn't be useful unless loss and damage was included. Apparently, there was some um, anger um, from, from them, and um, they made it known to some. But really, for me, I was too busy trying to work out how we keep our voices loud and clear. We know what our positions are. We won't be influenced by others who are trying to tell us whether or not we are able to put certain. We've always pushed that. We are always trying as civil society and as social movements to be authentic and clear and, and honest in our positioning. Thank you. Oh, I appreciate that. And it takes me back to sitting in the Vienna cafe or on the couches outside the negotiating room and just waiting for it. And that's really why this is so important for you to share because the CSW, it's the principal global intergovernmental body exclusively dedicated to promotion of gender equality and the empowerment of women. And you giving that behind the scenes aspect also encourages more people to be like, how could you leave out environmental human rights defenders? I was teaching a class in Geneva and the rising number is alarming. And it, it's yeah. you raising that lets us all know we have to put more effort to make sure that it's not excluded into the future. And Carlo, can you share with us a bit of some of the highlights or the side event that really mattered most to you during the CSW? Um, thank you, Joshua. Yes, um, um, I could share with the um, uh, side events, the session that I spoke in, which kind of um, it highlights the Pacific uh, frontline um, side events because of the Pacific uh, gang that's going to be speaking. So for me, um, personally speaking, first time to be engaged in CSW and even though it's from a virtual um, side um, session, so uh, even though I'm not there physically, but I could, uh, you know, it's, it's a very challenging because of coming, like I said, coming from a grassroots based, um, community based um, feminist work and also to, to speaking at a high level um, forum like that kind of pushes the work that we do here in the ground because we know that the, the, the work that we're doing, it's, you know, it has to link to regional and also to global because of um, the continuous work. It's, it's not always about, it's about the community. It's about the, the, the women that we work with because um, we um, we're at the front line of this urgency of this crisis because of, even though we're at the front line also, our bodies are being violated. Um, we face poverty at home. Um, uh, the members of our LGBT community are also face violence at home. Um, sex workers are also being violated at home. Um, the young girl, women and girls, they face the uh, SRHR, SR, um, sexual criminality and rights are not being recognized at home and in the community. So this work is important to us because even for me speaking at, at that side events, it kind of, I'm speaking also for the, about the community, for the community, because it has to be highlighted in the global level. It's not only here around here, because this is this is uh, so important because um, it has to lead up to the global level and also down again, because um, the community that we work with, it, it is it has to show that this work is, is not only here. It is it is uh, linked to regional, to national, to regional and global. So it is so important because it determines our future also. Um, we, we cannot get to do the work um, even if our bodies are violated or the environment around us is being destroyed, is being affected. So how can we do this um, very important work, this beautiful work, if the environment around us is breaking down, is being damaged, is being, um, you know, our homes being relocated. 
So for me, speaking at that um, side of it, also highlighted the work that we do here in Diva. It, it connects with women from the maritime, from the remote um, informal settlements, uh, women from the communities, LGBT women, also LGBT community as a whole. So, you know, it's, it's a very totally new experience. Um, you know, maybe um, when there's travel um, restriction is um, lifted, maybe uh, could feel the experience fiscally. But for me, uh, from talking uh, from home virtually, it is also very challenging, but it's a good experience. And we have um, other women like the families like Nolina Nambulgo and other families in the room, other Pacific families, um, the young uh, Pacific families also, the, young, the youth that is standing uh, with us on this and doing the campaign from at home, it kind of challenging and keep pushing because of the urgency of the issue. Um, because we um, we are looking after our planet and also as Pacific Islanders, uh, this is also uh, very important to us because of the beautiful environment that we have here in the Pacific, the beautiful beaches, the fish, um, the, the beautiful coconut trees, you know, Joshua. So yes, that's why we, it's important to us. It's true. It's it, in a way, even though the theme was achieving gender equality and empowerment of all women and girls in the context of climate change, environmental and disaster risk reduction policies and programs, mm -hmm. we're really, I think, in what you did in, is sharing that familial relationship with the Aina, with the earth, with the water, and explaining it so that people gain a great understanding of what is necessary going forward to protect the planet and the people who are taking care of this Mother Earth. Joshua, can you share, since that was the theme, why it was important, important for the Pacific Island Coalition uh, and the network to come together, and what were the highlights for PECAN? <clears throat> Thank you so much, Joshua. Yeah, right, Vika, this is also my first time actually participating in CSW 66, um, so it was a bit of a surreal experience, um, and I'm sure that some of my colleagues, it was also the first time for us. Um, from PCAN side, our work towards this began a couple of months before, primarily with the support of, of um, Diva for Equality and Nolin um, and Vika, who have been partners with PCAN. But we're on this new project um, supported by the EU. And part of that project was really outlining what are some of the key priorities for, for PCAN. And one of the first ones out of the field for us was definitely gender and climate change. And I think that was really because we're beginning to recognize, and I think that's true for the rest of the climate justice space in the Pacific and really around the world, that climate change is not just a bubble of its own and, and gender justice is not just a bubble of its own, that more often than not, the two of them are really issues that have a lot of intersections between them. And so it was so important for us that we begin to understand that to address issues of climate change and to address climate justice, we cannot do that without first addressing gender justice. Um, and so focusing on the intersectionalities between them was really important. And, and part of us doing that and the support that we really landed um, towards that in the lead up to the CSW 66 campaign um, was really in terms of mobilizing um, and helping with gaining uh, support online. And so we had this really brilliant um, CSW 66 campaign. We had a whole Twitter account that was created CSW 66 specific. Um, and part of the reasoning behind that is I think that we wanted to ensure that we were able to push out some key messages from us as organizations, but we also really wanted to connect with the people that we represent, with, with grassroots people, everyday people um, in Fiji and around the Pacific. Um, and so we went around um, asking people for their thoughts, um, their reflections around the theme of CSW 66. Um, and they gave us so many brilliant quotes and that's featured in our, in our Twitter pages. But that was something that I thought was really powerful about this campaign was that it was a really bottom-up approach. And we got to speak to so many different people, um, activists, climate justice activists, um, gender justice activists, uh, and really bring them into this process of CSW 66 and ensure that there was a bridge that was connecting and that it wasn't just happening at that global um, multilateral space. No, that was great. And it, it is true. We have to be able to translate the text from there at home. Mm -hmm. And maybe in our final five minutes we have, maybe you can share with us how, Nolene, you're looking at bringing the CSW to the community, as well as Carlo and yeah. Joshua, what we can do with that. 
Thank you, Joshua. Um, we've got many um, sets of regional initiatives, including the Pacific Leaders Gender Equality um, Declaration. I was part of the revision committee that's been looking at it over the last um, year or so. And part of that is making sure that climate change um, is not thought about, you know, often in the text, we think about it as a quote unquote emerging issue. There's no way it is. We've been part of this struggle, leading the struggle as Pacific peoples um, for, for decades. And, and I would say even back longer than that is the preservation and and the defense of our commons so we're just making sure that as we go into cop 27 that we're all clear on our roles um, and that that includes gender and human rights as a very very strong perspective um, we're part of a group um, that now is moving towards the work on cop 27 in egypt um, that will be at the end of the year and i'd really like people to join if they can and um, um Bula, hello from uh, to everyone in hawaii um, who's listening in and um, um, please be part of uh, the hashtag is CSW, uh, sorry, COP, uh, COP27 Pacific. So we've already started a, a Twitter group, and I really would love um, if people can get more and more involved. So one is about more of that. Two is about please may, let us make sure to the globe um, that everyone is clear that what we're talking about is um, the 1.5 trajectory, that we have to make sure that we keep our planet safe for ourselves, for other species, but also for the ecosphere, the living planet that, that keeps us here and keeps us alive. So I'll, I'll end there so the others have time. Thanks so much for this opportunity, Joshua. Yep. Mahalo, Kahlo. Final thoughts and bringing it home. Yes, um, thank you, Joshua. Um, for us, um, yes, during the, um, the CSW, when we have the campaign, we, when we go to the communities and we, and we tell them about we having this campaign, uh, it's leading to CSW 66. For them, um, because we are grassroots, um, what is CSW 66? So this is how the information is transferred uh, to them at grassroots level. So yes, for them to, to give out their thoughts and also for us when we're doing the work, we also have our photos taken and, you know, when as we're sending the campaign a message, we also send the photos. This is the work that we are doing on the ground. This is um, for us um, here in Diva and also around the, around the Pacific. You know, we're already doing biodiversity projects, you know, to conserve our natural resources. We already are doing, are setting up SRHR kits to villages in the Merton because of the, 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 the um, health set has been damaged or they've been attacked by, by the young men or by the youth. And also, we've been helping the urgent resource, urgent action to the community. So, you know, that, that, that uh, it's been said by Lori, the road to COP 27 Pacific. So, we are not just speaking and, you know, standing in front, you know, speaking, but we're also doing our background work here at home because of, you know, uh, speaking also comes with action. So, you know, for our fellow Pacific Islanders who are listening and also yeah, in Hawaii, you know, for us to also uh, stand up and also, you know, do the work on the ground, also protect our Pacific, because you know, uh, when speaking up out to to the to the global level, you know, you, we also have our work done here at home. So this also uh, their time to do their work and also to invest in us because of this climate uh, crisis. Thank you, Joshua. Thank you, Joshua. Sh sharing again about the Pacific Island Climate Action Network. What are some of the small plans and the significant first steps to bring this text home? Thank you so much, Josh. Um, so one of the first few things that we're doing at the policy level is that we're making sure that because sometimes when you read these outcomes documents in this text, they're very, um, they've got fancy hyperfluous language that can sometimes be lost, um, especially if we're trying to take it back to the community. So one of the first things that we're doing is we're trying to develop a lot of policy briefs, but we're making sure that we're using simple, um, plain language that's easy to understand, that communities can understand so that they have an avenue uh, upon which they're able to understand what's happening at that big UN multilateral space, that it's coming down directly back um, to them. And then, of course, the other thing that we're doing is that we're really beginning to make use of social media. Um, as Nolene and, and Vika had pointed out, this campaign that we ran, um, and it only started in the month of March, we had thousands of interactions, of impressions, um, huge follower counts, people that were really engaging with it. Um, and that really is the power of social media, the power of Twitter, is that it's this space where we can bring these high-level political messages back to communities, as well as transferring it back up to the people that we want to influence. Um, so I think that those are really the two avenues that we're beginning to use, is, is that policy space that we're holding on to, um, as well as the social media space and, and using the power of social media to connect with our communities. Thank you all three. You really are amazing to share the Oceania Gender and Climate Justice Advocacy with insights of what's going on at the global 
but focusing on achieving equality in the face of the climate crisis here at home in Moana Nui Akea. Thank you so much for joining. And we look forward to partnering for COP27 in the Pacific focus and making sure that we work on all these issues together. Mahalo for all the work you did at the CSW. And we know it's important seeds that will produce amazing new that will provide shade for future generations. Thank you so much for watching Think Tech Hawaii. If you like what we do, please like us and click the subscribe button on YouTube and the follow button on Vimeo. You can also follow us on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and LinkedIn, and donate to us at thinktechhawaii.com. Mahalo.